salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christ. And sing, sing it out, eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my tell you what, he's living right here right now. Thank you, everyone. We had to step back into the office. I can't always hear people singing in my office, but I heard you. <laughs> Amen. Sounds wonderful. I love that song, He Lives. Amen. Amen. So glad you're here tonight. I know that others are going to be coming in. We've been blessed. Uh, Brother Lemon's sermons have been powerful and uh, reviving. Amen. So, let's begin with a word of prayer here. I know he'll pray again. He'll ask us to come to our knees again. But let's just bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, it has been a wonderful journey. Very short journey here with Brother Lemon and his sons. We thank you for them, Father. We pray your richest blessings upon them. Your protection, Father. Uh, please take care of his wife and two daughters at home. And Lord, we look forward to the time when Jesus will look down from heaven. He look down here to see us. And Lord, may we be those of whom it is said there. That's what I've been waiting for. And now I can come home. I can bring them home. I can come go back to the earth and Rescue my children. Oh, Father, let your spirit come into us to sanctify us, to make us more like Jesus. And we sincerely ask it because we love him, because we ask it for his sake. Amen. Amen. I got a green light. Okay, there we are. Beautiful. All right. As uh, promised, we were going to have my son do another selection, so I'm going to ask him to please come forward to do another selection for us, and then after that, we will go into this evening's message. What shall we do? The assignment.
there is a man who now rests in his grave, but he is truly a fulfillment of Revelation 14 and verse 13, where it says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, because it talks about how though they sleep, their works still follow them. And this man has been a chief mentor in my life, and he goes by the name of W.D. Frizee. If any of you know Elder Frizee, and you know of his teachings, you know that he was a very powerful and mighty man of God. And it was one day while listening to my sermons on my phone that I, I heard him sing this hymn. And the hymn was hymn number 486, I Do Believe. And I said, that is so beautiful. As I listened to the words in that wonderful melody, and ever since then, I couldn't stop singing it. And I told my family, I said, I heard this hymn. you got to hear it. And, and the, the words are just so incredible. And that was the rendition that my son just did on the piano. I asked him. He said, Father, what do you want me to play? And I said, would you please play I Do Believe? And I'm just so grateful for that hymn. And I'm grateful for the gift that God has given to my son. And I know that the Lord is perfecting it onward and onward. And, and I just am excited to see it every year. It just keeps getting better. And I'm very grateful for that. We have reached the point in time where that's the question. Do you believe? Because I'll tell you what, if you do believe, then things are going to be different from this weekend onward in many of your lives. We stood up, we responded to appeals, we recognized the areas where we're falling short, we saw the areas where we need to grow. So that means if you and I really believe, things need to be different. You cannot go back to the way things used to be. You know, I was privileged to go to Romania. And as I went there, I sat down with one of the conference presidents there. And when I sat down with them, I asked a very important question. I sat down with the president and a few of his staff, and, and I asked them a question. I said, do you really, are you in agreement with the great call that Elder Ted Wilson has made reflecting that voice of Jesus, that God's church needs revival and reformation? I said, are you in agreement with that? And they said, yes, we're in agreement. I said, so then you do understand that our churches are dead. And the staff that he had with him looked at me very strangely when I said that. And they said, well, what do you mean by that? I said, well, by the very definition of the word revival, revival means that you need to resuscitate something that has stopped breathing. So I said, so if you really believe we need a revival, then that means you must recognize that we've gotten to a state that we have truly lost our pulse, or at least is losing our pulse. And they said, they said, you know, you're right. And then I said, well, if, you know, because we understand that, that means that once we're revived, we're going to need to reform some things. We can't put ourselves back into the situation that got us here in the first place. And so it is you're going to find that I want you to really assess yourselves. The very chief work of medical missionary work, and you're going to understand why I'm speaking in medical missionary terms, because you're going to find out by the conclusion of our presentation that every single one of you is supposed to be medical missionaries. Every single one of you. Now, true medical missionaries understand never treat symptoms, ascertain causes. That's the, that's the way a medical missionary thinks. No matter what the problem is in life, domestic, financial, spiritual, mental, or even physical, when we have a problem, God has not called us to treat just the symptoms of the problem. He calls us to ascertain the cause. How did this problem get here? And typically, the cure is in the cause. That's why it's good to ascertain causes. It's like when I sat down with a lady and she had high blood pressure. Her blood pressure was very high. And I remember talking with her, and as I began to walk her through some different things, I said, well, tell me, what have you been doing along the lines of diet? And she says, well, I know that salt is a great contributor to high blood pressure, so I stopped eating salt completely. And I said, well, sis, just remember that the body does need a certain amount of sodium. 
But I said, okay, so you eliminated your salt, so what did you replace it with? And she said, I replaced my salt with pepper. <laughs> and I said, you mean black, white pepper? She said, yeah. She says, I use that thing everywhere all the time. <laughs> And I took one of my little medical books with me, and I opened it up and had her read that sentence. I said, do me a favor, read that right there. And it was, it's books put together by medical doctors who support the teachings of inspiration as we've been given as it relates to health. And it said right there, pepper causes hypertension. So when she read that, she was uh, reformed. And do you know, in about three weeks, her blood pressure was perfect. I mean, this, in about three to four weeks, her blood pressure just went... Just by making certain changes in the diet, certain changes in the lifestyle, and trusting in Jesus, high blood pressure, gone. Bid thee farewell. The disease that is the silent killer and supposedly cannot find a cure was cured. And so you'll find that, you know, when we ascertain the cause, you will find the cure is typically in the cause. So when we talk about, well, why do we need revival and reformation, get to the cause. What was it that disconnected us from Jesus? Because Jesus says, I am your life. So if we need revival, it means that somewhere along the lines, Jesus got kicked out, but thank God, when he got kicked out, he didn't do what you and I would have done. You know what we would have done if we got kicked out of a house, right? We would have marked that house and said, I shall never return ever again. But when Jesus got kicked out, it was as if he got booted out, and immediately he turned right back and started knocking on our heart's door saying, please let me back in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is so different from us. And I thank God for that. And so you'll find that Jesus, he spoke to our hearts last night. He woke us up. He said, awake! Because he realized time is almost finished, and I want to bring you home with me. So therefore, last night was the awakening. This morning, he gave us instruction. He said, listen, you want to walk with me? You want to stay in the straight and narrow path? You want to stay counted amongst the few? He says, you need to understand what the will of my Father is and walk in that will. And so we understood it today. We received the instruction. And now that we got the instruction and we're awake, now he says, okay, now I have some assignments for you. I have some work for you to do. I'm going to tell you what you need to do. This is how I like to close out meetings when I work with the church. I like to give some very important instructions from the Lord so that it can help us know what we need to be doing right now. So with that being said, we're going to have a word of prayer. And as much as you're able to, I'd like to invite you to kneel with me as we have a word of prayer at this time. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful. You've been with us all throughout this blessed Holy Sabbath day of rest. We thank you, Lord, especially for myself and my children and others who were able to behold the scenes of nature today and to see how you speak to us, Lord God, even through the things of your creative works. Father, this is how Sabbath should be spent. Lord, I praise you and thank you for the privilege once again to press together and to study to show ourselves approved unto God that we can be workmen and work women that need not be ashamed, for we have rightly divided your words of truth. And so now that you have awakened us, Lord, and you have given us instruction, it is time to receive the assignments. And so, Father, may we take seriously that which is presented before us and help us to remember that the blessing is in the doing and not just being hearers of your word. Thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer. Abide with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. There are many things that God has given instruction for us to do, and I certainly am not going to give you something exhaustive. I'm going to give you that which I believe is going to help us to get a good start, and then as we get a good start, we'll know how the Lord will guide us to finish the race. So I'm going to give you some key principles that's going to help us to know what we need to do now that we are concluding our weekend together. Now, the first thing we're going to look at is the spiritual. There are spiritual things that the Lord has called us to do. There are things that we're going to need to take time and make a priority to do. Now, how many of you have ever been jealous before? Anybody ever been jealous? Okay, now, when you were jealous, do you remember how you behaved when you were jealous? Do you remember how protective you were over that thing that you were jealous about? Can you remember that there was a time in our lives that we were so jealous about a certain 
thing or a person that if something came too close to it, we would almost be ready to get physical to keep it back. Can we remember those days? You know, I was reading a little book, and I want you to take notes, brothers and sisters. It's good to write things down. There's a little book called Gospel Workers. And in the book Gospel Workers, page 100, you know what it tells us that we should do? It says that we should guard jealously. You want to know what it says we should guard jealously? Your time for prayer. It says guard jealously your time for prayer. Martin Luther, who was the great reformer, who gave great study and great powerful stands for the Lord, and of course was that wonderful individual whom God used in the great reformation, in the Protestant movement, he himself said that prayer is the better half of study. And Martin Luther was a man who f could find himself easily spending up to three hours in prayer. Three hours a day in prayer. You know, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was going through his great crisis as he was getting ready to go to Golgotha, when Jesus felt the pressure of what he was about to go through, I want you to see what Luke 22 says about Jesus. Luke 22. When you go to the book of Luke, the 22nd chapter, you will find that when Jesus himself was at the very height of the battle within, that great controversy within, my will versus God's will. It was in that great battle that the Bible says in Luke 22 that when the battle got so heated and so hot to the point that he began to sweat drops of blood, the Bible says in Luke 22, in verse 42, it says, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, verse 44, and being in agony, what did he do? He prayed more earnestly. Do you know that's the opposite of what we typically do? The more that we go through trials and the more that we are faced with difficulties in life, many a times we find ourselves praying less and acting more, trying to solve our own issues. Guys especially have this problem, ladies, because we are naturally problem solvers. In our minds, we like to solve problems and get things done and move on to the next project and the next assignment. But a lot of times we must understand that Jesus, the man of men, Jesus, when he was in agony, when he was in his greatest crisis, he didn't pray less. The Bible says he prayed more earnestly. That was an example for you and I, that when we go through the agonizing issues of life, when we go through the great challenges and the great trials and the temptations, we must learn the culture of prayer, pleading with God. In the book Early Writings, Ellen White talks about that group that she saw with faces that were pale. And she, she says that she saw that they were going through an internal struggle. And she says they, they were agonizing and pleading with God to get the victory over self and sin. And she says that those same individuals, at a certain point in their experience, their face began to light and as they began to light up, she says, they had gotten the victory. She looked to her angel. She said, what was this that took place? And the angel said, it is the latter rain that has fallen upon them. You don't think God wants you to be counted amongst that number? But brothers and sisters, if you and I do not understand the agonizing prayer that we need to have with Jesus right now, there's no way that we're going to understand it and experience it in the time soon to come. And so we must set time for prayer. We're talking about assignments. If you know that you can wake up in a day and literally go through a day, and the only prayer that you might have said is, God is grace, God is good, let us thank him for our food. If you know that's the only time that you're spending time in prayer, God says you have already created the formula for failure. We must understand the need for agonizing prayer. And what God told us to do is he says, make time for it. 
God is not, God is wise. He knows that in this day and age, in a bad economy where everybody's hustling, trying to make money and all these other things, brothers and sisters, God understands the need for setting time for prayer because I don't know if you've noticed it. Have you ever noticed that you can wake up in the morning and it almost seems like the day just flew by and before you know it, the day is done and it's over and you can look back and say, I've had no communion with God today. No wonder we're so powerless. No wonder we keep falling back into the trap of sin. And you know what's so sad? As elementary as this is, very, very few people do it. I believe with all of my heart, I have resolved in my mind that, you know, I realize there are some things that I've shared ever so often that people will say, wow, I didn't know that. But for the most part, I believe that the ministry that God has given to Dwayne Lemon is to simply be a heavenly reminder of things you already know but don't practice. I'm serious. Things that we already know, but very few of us are literally implementing it. Spending that time in prayer. So therefore, I'm reminding you of what the Word of God says. Now, do you know God is so good that he even gave us an idea of how we can spend time in prayer? You want to know what it is? It's found right here in the book of Psalms 55. Notice what it says on the screen. Evening and morning and at noon... Will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice? You see how simple that is? God is helping us. He's saying, listen, I can even help give you a lead, evening, morning, and at noon. That's why when the Bible says Daniel would go ahead and pray, even when the crisis was coming to him. You see, Daniel was able to be faithful unto God when Babylon's pressures were coming on him because Daniel was simply doing that which he had always done. Many of us are trying to get last-minute righteousness. We're trying to go ahead and skip Bible study, skip prayer, skip all the biblical priorities of life, and we think that when the crisis comes, all of a sudden we're just going to snap into a bunch of holy people ready to face the beast and his mark. That's a deception. If we do not create the culture of prayer now, we will not know how to pray. We're going to do what comes natural, and that's going to be to trust in self. And so the first assignment God says is, number one, you need to set times for prayer. If you know. Now, if you're a family, brothers and sisters, this gets very easy. Every morning and every evening, we need to be having family worship. Every morning and every evening, we should be having family worship. If you know that you're not praying with husband and wife, if you know you're not praying with children, every evening, every morning, that's your first work. God is going to look at all of us and say, where's the little flock that I've given you? And if you and I don't give God the right answer, we are in trouble. I have a very special passion and burden for the home, brothers and sisters, because like never before, Satan is attacking the homes of the remnant. And God wants us to recognize we need to start making prayer a priority. So if we're not spending time every evening, every morning, and at noon, if we're not coming together, family members and so on, spending time in prayer, God is saying, that's your first work. So number one, assignment number one, the priority of prayer. Start looking at your day schedule, especially for those of you who are business owners or self-employed, because you're, you, listen, write this down, Great Controversy, page 519. It says in Great Controversy, page 519, Satan well knows that those whom he can get to neglect prayer and the searching of the scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. Let me repeat that. In Great Controversy 519, it says Satan well knows that those whom he can get to neglect prayer and the searching of the scriptures will, did not say maybe, might, or more than likely, it says will be overcome by his attacks. And then it says, he therefore creates all sorts of devices that will distract us so that we won't spend time. Sometimes a promotion at the job is from Satan. Can Satan give success? Yes, he can. The Bible shows it in Matthew 4. He came to Jesus. He says, you bow down to me, I'll give you everything make you rich. Not every promotion, not every new uh, stage of business success may have come from God. Because if you find in the midst of my growth and my success, there's no time for prayer. There's no time for the searching of the scriptures. There's no time for communion with family. 
Brothers and sisters, I can guarantee you that promotion came from the enemy, not from Jesus. He will create all sorts of things. Facebook, Facebook, brothers and sisters, can be a tool. 99% of the time it's not used as a tool, but it can be a tool for ministry. But brothers and sisters, as my dear evangelist friend uh, Jeremiah Davis said, if Facebook keeps your face out of this book, that's a problem. And some people are spending hours in Facebook and they're, take, and they're taking their faces out of the book of life as it's revealed in the Bible. That's a problem. There are individuals, brothers and sisters, who are spending more time on computers and games and all these other things. Satan will create whatever device he can, even smartphones. Things that were designed and could be used for the glory of God, but many a times are not. We're spending, we're on the game centers and we're playing games, even to the point that we'll do it in the sanctuary or on the Sabbath. And we're wondering why there's such a dearth, there's such a famine in the land for the word of God. Because we're creating these environments. So therefore, brothers and sisters, prayer must be a priority. Number two, prophecy. Specifically, the book Evangelism tells us something. We need to get back into the study of prophecy. I want you to consider this quotation here. Ministers should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of Seventh-day Adventists. The prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation should be carefully studied. And in connection with them, the words, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I was privileged to be at a church last week in Baltimore where they actually, the pastor, was leading out in taking the church through the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation right now. He understands that the ministers need to do this. And so it is that I love the fact that there are many churches today that are now getting into this. And brothers and sisters, if you have not understood this yet, if you have not done this yet, this is something God is calling us to do. He's saying we need to get rooted and grounded in prophecy. We need to get back to our foundations. You know why? What's those two things that God told us we need right now? The greatest and most urgent of all of our needs. What is it? Revival and reformation. It says revival and reformation are the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs right now. You know what's so deep? Write this down. Testimonies to ministers and gospel workers, page 113. You know what testimonies to ministers and gospel workers, page 113 says? It says, when we study the book of Revelation and understand what it means to us, it says it will create a great revival within us. When we study what book? The book of Revelation. Watch this. Testimonies of Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 118. You know what Testimonies of Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 118 says? It says, when studying the book of Daniel and the Revelation, it will also cause a great reformation within us. Did you get it? When we study the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, it will give us and bring to us, when rightly received and understood, it will bring about a revival and a reformation. And so we need to get back into prophecy. So if you find that there are no studies going on right now between cottage meetings as well as meetings that you can start in this church, the assignment that God is giving to us is, number one, he says, set time for prayer. Number two, he is also saying, start studying the specific points that make up what the Bible calls, what the Bible calls, what the Bible calls present truth. The reason why I say that is because many people think that present truth is limited to a ministry that's located in some point of California. Present truth is not limited to some ministry or church in California. Present truth is a Bible term. 2 Peter 1.12, the Bible says that God would have us to be established in the present truth. Truth for this time. And right now, like never before, you and I should be understanding the third angel's message because we are at the close of that message. And we must understand it not just intellectually, but experimentally. It's one thing to know the three angels' messages. It is a whole different ballgame, brothers and sisters, to experience the three angels' messages. And so we need to get back into prophecy. 
If you do not currently have any prophecy classes going on here, and I'm talking about, pro listen, we want to win the souls outside, and we're called to do that, and we must do that. Can you say amen to that? Amen. All right. But brothers and sisters, wouldn't it be a tragedy if somebody from the outside came in as a result of a revelation seminar, and one day they're sitting next to you in potluck and saying, isn't that amazing about Daniel too and such and such, and they're telling you about the things they just learned, and you and I are there, ignorant as anything, saying, you know, I don't even know what they're talking about. Because we don't understand prophecy ourselves. Wouldn't that be a tragedy? Do you know how many of us do not know how to show the mark of the beast just from the Bible? We love to quote Rome and say, oh, Rome said that the authority of the church is manifested as a result of them saying Sunday is our mark of ecclesiastical authority and so on. But brothers, and sisters, do you know you don't need Rome to tell you? Do you know that you can go straight to the basic instructions before leaving earth, the Bible? You can pick up that Bible and you can show them beyond a shadow of a doubt a whole Sunday law crisis right there in the Bible. You should be able to do that. You and I should be able to understand time and then based on time know exactly to say, Israel, this is what we should be doing right now. You can do that when you understand prophecy. And so I'm going to even recommend a couple of books to you, because uh, I'm very serious. Uh, the assignment meeting is not a meeting of, of quote-unquote presentation. I'm literally talking with you. I'm studying with you. Because of the fact that the assignment aspect is about embracing a work and doing it. One book that we are told through inspiration that we should study is the book called Daniel and the Revelation by Uriah Smith. We are told over 15 times in the writings of Ellen White that we should study that book for it presents solid truth, present truth for this time. So that if you don't have that book, that's something you can get. You can get groups of you together and literally get the book, Daniel and the Revelation, and you can start studying it. There are scores and scores of books. Now, one book that I'll definitely recommend, we're doing this book right now at a church in Atlanta, Georgia. Every Monday night, there's literally 50 people, up to 45 to 50 people who show up on a Monday night to study the Word of God. Write this book down. This book is good. It's called Coming Events and Crisis at the Close. You can start a Bible group with this. It walks you through first angel, second angel, third angel, historical first, then present application now. It walks you point by point, step by step, the marvelous workings of Satan, the national Sunday law, the loud cry, the latter rain. It walks you through step by step all of the end time events that God has told us. It's a book by a man by the name of W.D. Frizee. Coming events and crisis at the close. That book was a curriculum book for all the medical missionary students at Wildwood when Elder Frizee was alive. It's not the book they use today. Coming events and crisis at the close. You can get books like this. Form the groups. Invite the people. Cottage meetings. Come together. Get your young people involved. And have them study. You'll be amazed. Now, you know what's so sweet? Look at the quote again. Ministers should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of Seventh-day Adventists the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation should be carefully studied, and in connection with them, the words what? Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That sanctuary language. The very fact that Jesus is referred to as the sacrificial animal within the sanctuary service is the sanctuary language. Therefore, it is not going to be enough to just simply study Bible prophecy, but you're going to want to study it in connection with the sanctuary. Get back into the sanctuary message, brothers and sisters. This is who you are. If you and I deviate from the sanctuary, I guarantee you, you're going to have a skewed view of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Jesus said, I am the way. Thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. Christ is in the sanctuary. When we understand the sanctuary message, we understand Jesus best. When we understand the sanctuary message, we will understand the cross best. In Great Controversy, page 489, it says that 
It is in the holy of holies, the most holy place, she says that the cross of Calvary is best reflected. In the sanctuary, we can understand the cross. And do you know one of the first things the sanctuary will teach us? Is that it all did not end at the cross. Isn't that something? That's a great problem that the world believes. The world believes today that everything came to an end at the cross. The gospel came to an end. Brothers and sisters, that contradicts the whole sanctuary message. Now, I don't mind when non-Adventists say that. What hurts me is when seven-day Adventists say that. Because a, seven -day, a true seven-day Adventist would never say that. Because the cross represents, is coincides with the outer court. Lamb slain on the altar of sacrifice, out of court. Lamb slain on the cross, tied in together. But brothers and sisters, did not the priest take the blood and then go into another phase of the work? Yes. So therefore, how can we say that everything ended at the cross? Jesus had to obviously ascend into the holy place and then from there go to do his next work. Now, let me say this also just as, a, as something to think about. Have you noticed that I've been reading from a King James Version? Have you noticed that? Now, is there anybody here who does not have a King James Version? Anybody? With, with us right now. Is there anyone who does not? What, what version is that, Pastor? New King James? All right, good. Now, here's some things you want to be mindful of when you go through your study. The relevance of the Seventh-day Adventist church is the sanctuary message. Is that right? That's our great contribution to Christianity, revealing the gospel through the sanctuary. Can you say amen to that? All right. Now, understanding that point, I want you to consider this. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. I want you to go to Hebrews 9, and I want us to read verse 12. Now, we believe as Seventh-day Adventists that Jesus entered the most holy place at what time? What time period in earth's history? 1844. Are you sure? Did he go into, did he go into the most holy place before then? Huh? When? When? Can we show that from the Bible? Where? John chapter 20, okay, and it shows what? That's right, but, but that doesn't say that, that he went to the most holy place. Right. So therefore, where in the Bible do we find that Jesus went to the most holy place before 1844? Because that's what I'm asking. All right. Now watch this. Pastor, I'm going to ask you, can we get this mic on? I want you, now let's, let's look at this in the natural sense. You are at the earthly tabernacle. In the earthly tabernacle, which room do you come to first when you're seeking forgiveness of sins? What's the first room you come to? Where? Okay, you're not hearing me. Either you're not hearing my question or maybe you just don't understand the sanctuary. I said you. Where is the first room that you go to when you are seeking pardon as it relates to the earthly tabernacle? I hear the most holy, boy. Okay, brother, we're going to need to study, okay? The first place you're going to go to... Say again? I said room? Okay. Okay, which place? Well, let me, let me put it this way. You know you don't go to this room, right? Okay. What place do you have to come to first? The outer court. Okay, good. So we're on the same page. All right. <laughs> right, but we're talking physically right now. So we first go to the outer court. Is that right? Okay. When you and I present the animal, we have to exercise faith that the priest is going to finish that work because eventually you have to leave. Because can you go inside here? No. So the priest has to go in. So that means you're going to have to trust that the priest is going to take care of your sin. Amen. Good lesson on righteousness by faith. Now, when that happens, does the priest go from here to there? 
the priest always goes here. Is that right? Okay. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, the cross represents what? The altar sacrifice, which is where? Out of court. Good. Then, according to the earthly structure, where would the next place be that the priest would go? To the holy place. Is that right? Pastor, can you please tell us what Hebrews 9.12 says? It says that Jesus... It says that Jesus... No, no. <laughs> you want this on your you want this recording? I want this on recording. All right, here we go. It says that Jesus goes to the most holy place. And that was from what version, Pastor? A lot of versions say that. There you go. So therefore, do you see how sometimes by the very version of the Bible that we may read, it can actually redirect our thoughts? And if we're not careful, it can begin to sweep our foundations. This is the reason why it is well and it is good and it is very wise to stick with the authorized version that is able to magnify on those points very well. Sure. Very true. However, I think we should be ready to explain to people because what you've really told us is also uh, necessary to us as we give Bible studies. Yes. We need to be ready to realize that that's the problem here and explain it to people. Point well taken, and that is the point. So the first thing that you and I want to do is we want to get familiar with our sanctuary message. Now, brothers and sisters, let me ask you a question. When somebody asks you your first and last name, how long do you need to think about it before you give an answer? You can give it snap of a finger super quick. Is that right? Now, Great Controversy, page 488 says, the subject of the sanctuary in connection with the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. Can you pull the average Seventh-day Adventist aside and say, tell me about the gospel through the sanctuary? And that's the reason why we exist, is to tell people about the gospel through the sanctuary. Amen. Huh? Amen. So therefore, when you're building up that study life in your assignments, number one, you're setting up that time for prayer. Number two, you are setting up your time for Bible study. The focus in your study is to see Christ as you study prophecy. By the way, let me show you how Jesus gave the gospel. Mark chapter 1. Can anybody preach better than Jesus? No. No. So notice what the Bible says in Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, notice what the Bible says. And we're going to look at verses 14 and 15. Because if we want to be like Jesus, we should preach like Jesus. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Now look at this. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says in Mark 1, 14. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying the what? The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So was Jesus preaching the gospel? And what was he preaching the gospel based on? Time. Did you see that? He said the time is fulfilled. And when he was talking about time, was he talking about prophecy? Yes, he was. So therefore, brothers and sisters, Jesus preached the gospel based on prophecy. So when you and I preach the gospel, we are to give the gospel as the master did it. And when Jesus gave the gospel, he gave it based on prophecy. Because remember, what's the benefit of understanding time? You know what to do. So therefore, set the time for prayer. Number two, set time for Bible study. What's your focus? You're going to understand the books of Daniel and Revelation, and you're going to understand their correlation to the sanctuary. Now, from a recommendation standpoint, a book that would be excellent to go through, number one, is a book called The Cross and Its Shadow by Stephen Haskell. If you've never studied that book before, excellent book. Get the groups together. Come together. Start studying these things. This is what God's church did many, many years ago in the pioneers' days. They went through these topics. They studied these things out until they owned it. They would study it out until the point that they didn't have to call their favorite evangelists and teachers and pastors and preachers and say, hey, what did you think? They were able to say, I know what the text is saying. 
we got to get back to that, brothers and sisters, because you're about to be tested on what you believe. And I'm telling you the truth. This is why the majority of Seventh-day Adventists are going to turn away from this truth when that final test comes to them, because they did not properly prepare. They were not rooted and grounded. This is imperative for us to understand. So therefore, our assignment, set times for prayer and stick to it. Guard it jealously. Let not the cell phone business or anything get in the way. Amen? Amen. Then number two, set time for study. You know how your lives are. You know that the day can sweep by us, and before you know it, it's gone. And wives, let me tell you something. Love your husbands, but don't lean on them for knowledge. I'm serious. You know, it almost seems like it is so natural that the husband is always deeper in Bible truth than the wife. There's nothing in the scriptures that says that's supposed to be. While a man may have a certain position and certain means of how they function in church, God is a God of order, and God has set the men up to do certain things, and he set the women up to do other things. But brothers and sisters, God makes it clear that we all should know his word just the same. Just because a man is privileged to hold certain roles in the church does not mean that he is supposed to by default know more than the woman would know. That's not true. Don't believe that. I don't know where that ideology came from, but I can guarantee it's from Satan. Our sisters should understand the deep things of God just as much as the men. Brothers, we should not leave it up to our ladies to be the only ones who show up for prayer meeting. We should not be the only ones that leave it up to the ladies to be the prayer, quote unquote, warriors in the home. God has called men to fall on their knees as well. God has called men to know what it is to plead and cry and sigh and ask God for the outpouring of his spirit. Men should know that too. So get rid of this social worldly foolishness that is now coming to God's church where we think that it's the ladies that are the prayer people and it's the men that are the deep students of scripture. God says this is for everybody. Amen. 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 So therefore we are setting time to study the word of God, going through the sanctuary, going through prophecy and all these other things. The spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy. I'm going to give you, I, I have so much instruction to give you, so I'm, I'm going to go through this quickly because I'm giving assignments, okay? Write this down. We're going to fast forward through this. Write this down because I've got other things I've got to share with you. I want you to write down 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 10. Now, when you write down 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 10, what I want you to understand is that in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 10, I'm going to tell you the story. You can check the preacher on it and make sure that everything's right, but I know it's right. In 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 10, the first four verses deals with Israel as they left Egypt on their way to Canaan land. It talks about how they went through the water and they were baptized of Moses through the sea and how Christ the rock was following them. Now, by the time you get to verses 5 to 10, it starts to talk about where the children of Israel messed up. It starts to talk about all their failures, everything from they committed fornication, they began to murmur and complain, they began to make all these horrible mistakes and suffered the results of it as well. Now, verse 11 is key. Turn 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Verse 11 is the one I want you to hold on to. Now, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, here's what the Bible says. Please say amen when you get there. Now, in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, after Paul rehearses this history of the children of Israel, it says in verse 11, now all these things happen unto them. Who's the them? Israel. It says all these things happen unto them for what? And samples. What does the word and sample mean? Example. Now, if the word and sample means example, what does it say in verse 6? Verse 6, what does it say? Does it use the word example there? Yes, it does. But in verse 11, it says, and sample, two different words with two different meanings. And sample does not mean example. So what does the word and sample means? Now, if you've got a good Bible, you should be able to see right in your margin what the word means. Very good. Can you say that a little louder for us, please? Types. Types. That's very important. Very important. That word and sample means types. 
And anytime you have a type, that means you have to have an anti-type. Very good. Now, now look at how Paul finishes out the verse to introduce the anti-type. He says, now all these things happen unto them for types. But now he transitions and says, and they are written for our admonition. And he specifies who the hour is by saying, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Who's that? Us. So therefore, what the children of Israel went through as they left Egypt on their way to Canaan land was a type of what God's people will go through as they leave the Egypt of sin on their way to heavenly Canaan. And that's why when you study the Old Testament, it's not past truth, it's present truth. Now, one of the things, now, what was one of the things God used to help the children of Israel get out of Egypt and then also be preserved from going back into it? Very good. Let's go to the book of Hosea. We're going to the book of Hosea, and we're going to Hosea chapter 13. Notice what the Bible says. We're going to the book of Hosea, and we're going to Hosea chapter 13. 13. Now, I want you to see what the Bible says. I'm sorry, Hosea 12. Hosea 12. Now, Hosea 12, look at what it says in verse 10. Because the instruments that God used to help Israel in their journey and to preserve them from going back in it is the same instruments God's going to use in the last days for his last people to help them get through as well. Notice what it says in Hosea chapter 12 and verse 10. The Bible says, I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Verse 13. And by a what? By a prophet, the Lord brought Israel what? Out of Egypt. And by a prophet, was he preserved? So the same way that God would use a prophet to help benefit Israel, not only to come out of Egypt, but to preserve them from going back into Egypt, is the same way in these last days God is raising up a, has raised up a prophet that is also to preserve us from going back into Egyptian worship, Egyptian lifestyle, sinful lifestyle. And that prophet that God gave to this remnant church is none other by the name of Ellen G. White. Her writings are authoritative. We have terribly misapplied a quotation of which she said when she talked about the lesser light and the greater light. And many people say, well, she's the lesser light and the Bible's the greater light. And my question is this, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that when you say that? Are you saying she's less inspired? Are you saying she's less authoritative? What do you mean, and what do you think she meant when she said it? Now, I studied out the quote, and I don't believe that. I literally went, I went meticulously through the quote, because that's how we're taught to read, read in context. I believe with all my heart, she is that lesser light, and Jesus is the greater light. I believe the Bible teaches that. In John chapter 1, you see John, he was a light. But he was a lesser light, and it literally says in John 1 that he pointed people to the greater light, which was Jesus. When you study prophecy and you study Genesis chapter 1, when you look at the sun and the moon comparison, remember the moon was to represent the Old Testament prophets and the Old Testament symbols, and the sun was supposed to represent the New Testament era and the New Testament truths, and the New Testament truth brought us into the era of Christ. The Old Testament system was dealing with the prophets, and brothers and sisters, the prophets were referred to as lesser lights, and Christ, who refers to himself as the S-U-N of righteousness, is the greater light. And you know what happens? Nowadays, you can tell people what Sister White says, and it seems as if we don't remember our baptismal vows anymore. We said, oh, we believe that the remnant church has the gift of prophecy, and the list goes on. But then once you start to redirect people and say, well, inspiration says such and such. Oh, I don't want to hear that. Tell me what the Bible says. I don't want to hear what Ellen White says. And we don't understand that there's a solemn statement from inspiration. 
it says, one thing is what? Certain. Those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner will first give up their faith in the warnings and reproofs contained in the testimonies of God's Spirit. When you meet Seventh-day Adventists that say, I don't care what Ellen White says, you know what, that means nothing to me. Just tell me what the Bible says. Brothers and sisters, those individuals are preparing for the mark of the beast. They are preparing to join under Satan's banner. Either this is a statement from a little old lady with, from the, with a third grade education from the 1800s, or it's the testimony of Jesus. You decide. I've decided. I receive that as the testimony of Jesus. And anything Jesus says, I take seriously. One thing is certain, that those seven-day Adventists who will join under Satan's banner will first give up their beliefs of the reproofs and warnings contained in the testimonies of God's Spirit. And do you know what typically happens? Notice. It is Satan's plan to, one, weaken the faith of God's people in the testimonies. So first somebody says, oh, I don't believe what Ellen White says, but watch, it doesn't stop there. Then phase two, next, follows skepticism in regard to the vital points of our faith, the pillars of our position. Have you noticed that? First, the individuals who claim to be Seventh-day Adventists, oh, I believe in everything. Then all of a sudden they say, well, actually, I begin to question the, the writings of Ellen White. And then after a while, when they begin to reject her writings, all of a sudden they start saying things like, well, you know, that sanctuary message, eh. Oh, you know, Jesus having the nature of Adam after the fall, when it says over 400 times in the spirit of prophecy that Jesus had the nature of Adam after the fall. So all of a sudden, oh, I don't believe that really about the nature of Christ anymore. Then all of a sudden, natural effect, well, you know what? I really don't know about this victory over sin thing. After all, praise God, we're just justified. No more sanctification. And all the vital points of our faith begin to knock down, but that doesn't stop there. Then it says, then doubt as to the Holy Scriptures. Before you know it, you can start quoting them the Bible and say, well, the Word of God says, and they say, you know what? Maybe that's just your interpretation and my interpretation is different. You know, after all, how can we really know that this book is inspired? Perhaps it is just different opinions and thoughts. Well, this is how I see it. And after a while, the authority of the Holy Scriptures are made of none effect and then step four, and then the downward march to perdition. It says, when the testimonies which were once believed are doubted and given up, Satan knows the deceived ones will not stop at this, and he redoubles his efforts till he launches them into open rebellion, which becomes incurable and ends in destruction. Volume 4, The Testimony to the Church, page 211. And you want to know what? Right here in your state, how many of you remember this letter? March 15, 2010. Dear, dear Elder Cavines, it is with careful consideration that I submit my letter of resignation as interim pastor, associate pastor in the Southern California Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, effective March 31st, 2010. What does it say? Though I've witnessed and experienced my share of challenges with leadership, I assure you that this decision is not the result of any disagreement or ill treatment from the membership or the leadership. My reason for resigning is simply this. God is calling me to preach and teach the unadulterated gospel found solely in Scripture rather than the gospel plus Ellen G. White and the SDA doctrines. In effect, what Galatians 1 calls another gospel. One of your ministers, one of your former ministers right out here in California. It says, I can no longer agree to preach or teach the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church or through my silence imply that I agree with them. But allow me to be plain and specific because I have been a student of the word and been sensitive to the Lord's leading and teaching. I no longer believe that the scripture supports, one, the mission of the church, the three angels' messages. Out the window. Vital points. It says the SDA church is the remnant church, fundamental belief, number 13. The investigative judgment, pre-advent judgment, fundamental belief, number 24. Ellen G. White is a messenger of God, fundamental belief, number 18. Sabbath is the seal of God, and the great controversy, worldview, fundamental belief, number 8. And it's happening all around us. And you know why people don't like Sister White? Because she touches on things in a very pointed manner. Now, brothers and sisters, let me ask you something. I'm being honest with you, okay? And I'm doing this because I'm your brother, and I want, I want you and I to think together. Is that all right? 
There was a time that Seventh-day Adventists had a clear position on jewelry and adornment. Am I the only one who knows this, or did you know it too? There was a time. We had a clear position. Today, that topic has become so gray, and it's almost very rarely taught before the people. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm, I'm being honest with you. I'm laboring with you. I, I really am, okay? Let me ask you a question. Listen to my question carefully. How do you pick up this book? What is this book? How do you pick up the Bible and go to young people who have earrings and neck chains and all these other things all over them? Would you tell those individuals that they need to take those off to be part of the family of God? Would you tell them that today? You sound like the mixed multitude. We don't even know anymore, do we? The Word of God hasn't changed. Did you know that? We've changed. And we didn't change for the better. I can guarantee you that. That's why we're mumbling. We should be able to clearly say, absolutely not. It was a standard of God as it relates to adornment and how an individual covers themselves or dresses themselves. Volume 6 of the Testimony to the Church, page 95, says that with the baptismal candidates, one of the subjects that we should bring before them is the subject of dress and adornment. Now, how do you take this book? Do you want to win your young people? Do you want to win them? I'm very serious. You know one thing young people hate? Hypocrisy and double standards. I'm very serious. I'm opening the floor for anyone to respond to me. How do you take the Bible and go to a young person and tell them, God has a standard on jewelry and adornment, and therefore these earrings and neck chains and so on are inappropriate. 1 Peter 3, 3, 1 Timothy 2, 9, Isaiah 3, 16 through 26, Deuteronomy 32. I mean, you, we have the text. We have the text. It's not that the Bible verses are not there. They're there. Now, here's my thing. How do you tell a young person that your jewelry is inappropriate when you and I have our big diamond rings right on our ring fingers? How do you take the Bible and help them see that they need to take theirs off while we keep ours on. I said the Bible, because I know, it's, I know what many will say, oh, we voted on it. Now, brothers and sisters, listen to me. Listen to me. I joined this church because I was told that we do not make decisions based on the counsel of men. We base our decisions on the word of God. And every vote that has been done should be based on the word of God. So therefore, don't tell me the vote. That, that's not strong enough. How do you open your Bible and say to your precious young people that you need to take these things off, but at the same time, we have ours on? And how do we justify us having ours on while we try to tell them to take it off? And if we try to say, well, it's because I'm married, and my marriage represents a covenant of such and such and such, brothers and sisters, a young person could say, this college ring represents four to eight years toiling in college. And that's important to me. So with all due respect, while your marriage is important to you, my toiling in college is important to me. Dear child, you need to take that neck chain off. Okay, well, you go ahead and you, 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 the child says, well, why should I take my neck chain off when you keep your wedding band on? And they say, well, you know, uh, uh, it represents my marriage, my covenant. They say this neck chain is a family heirloom that has passed through five generations. How do you tell them take theirs off and so on? And do you know what? We can't. And that's why ever since that vote took place, we have never seen so much jewelry in the Seventh-day Adventist church. There was a time I used to come to the Seventh-day Adventist church and I would say, praise the Lord, we have visitors because I saw all the jewelry. <laughs> Going to win souls today. <laughs> and next thing you know, you shake their hand and they say, oh, I'm the deaconess. I'm the deacon. Not, not, they're not just members, they're leaders. Messages of confusion. Young people don't like confusion. They like consistency. They really do. I'm being serious with you. And then, God help us, if that young person goes to testimonies to ministers and gospel workers, page 180 and 181, where it says, not 
One penny should be spent on a circlet of gold to testify that we are married. God help us if they come across that quote. Because then they're going to say, okay, so then how do you... Testimonies of Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 180 and 181, and it says not one penny should be spent on a circlet of gold to testify that we are married. I'm telling you, these are the issues of what's turning people off. They're saying you guys have double standards. One minute you're telling me this, the next minute you're telling me that. One minute you give me a health message, I come to your potluck, you're serving me the stuff that your health message contradicted. So then the people are saying, why do I want to join this? I already have confusion in the world. You get what I'm saying? I'm being honest with you. So when I talk about the assignments, brothers and sisters, get back to the Bible, get back to the spirit of prophecy, and do what God says, period, and let the chips fall where they may. It's the only people who are going to experience true revival and true reformation. I'm not encouraging revolution. I'm not encouraging taking picket signs and going before conference buildings or any other place and start talking about, look, look, look. But brothers and sisters, there's things we do. This is God's church. There's no question about that. I'm settled on that. And God is not calling us to break out and start other independent groups and offshoots and all those things. That's not the answer. But if we think that sitting down and being quiet while we are watching things that are erroneous, things that perhaps may be issues of apostasy. If we're going to sit back and just watch it happen and think, oh, well, I guess God will handle it. Brothers and sisters, God makes it clear. To be neutral at a time of crisis is considered in the eyes of God as treason against his truth. You can't sit down if you love God and if you love his people. You know love will make you open your mouth? Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. I stand before you as a self-supporting gospel worker. What that means is that I left a lucrative job because God called me into this work. I would have gone to, my, to the schools and to my, to my conference and said, please, can you employ me if that's the direction God led me? But he didn't lead me in that direction. There are three types of workers that's going to finish the work, and I'm going to talk about it at the Claremont Church this week. The three types of workers are lay workers, denominational workers, and self-supporting workers. And all three are ordained of God to work together to finish the work. God called me as a self-supporting worker, which means that when people say, Brother Lemon, what's your income? I say Matthew chapter 20, verse 4. You know what Matthew 20, verse 4 says? Whatever's right is what I'll give you. God is my boss, and he promised me, son, whatever's right is what I'll give you and your family. And God has been giving us what is right over these past few years as we've been self-supporting workers. And sometimes individuals think, well, if I'm a self-supporting worker and if I'm, if I'm relying on God through the people and so on to go ahead and compensate me, I got to make sure that my message is of such a way that it stays friendly. I've already told God, I said, I will go to QT gas station and sweep their floors before I water down this truth before God's people. Amen. And you know why? Because I love you. That's what love does. Love will make you open your mouth when many want to remain silent. Love will make you speak out. The key thing is always remain tactful. Always be redemptive. Always point it all back to Jesus Christ. These are the things, this is the work that Jesus did. This is the work that John the Baptist did. Brothers and sisters, we've got to give the truth to the people. And it is inconsistent to say, well, we, we, we practice these things when we have clear quotations from the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy that says otherwise. You got to choose which one you're going to follow. As for me and my house, we already made our choice. You got to make yours. Time for prayer. Get back into the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, the sanctuary message, and the spirit of prophecy, brothers and sisters. It is God's love letters from heaven. When a young man has issues, take him to that love letter called Messages to Young People, full of instruction. When God's church is going through challenges, take them to those nine love letters called Testimonies to the Church, volumes one through nine. When the minister is having challenges and does not know what he ought to do, God has a love letter called Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers. When you're saying, oh, I don't know how to study the Bible right and so on, God says, I have five love letters called Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, and Great Controversy. You're saying, oh, I'm having problems with husband and wife? God says, I have a love letter called Adventist Home. 
I'm having problems guiding my children. God says, I have a love letter called child guidance. God has love letters, brothers and sisters, all over the place. And I'll share this story with you. I went to my new church, the church that I'm a member of now. And, uh, you know, I went to Newton County Seventh-day Adventist Church under the Georgia Cumberland Conference. They still like me. We're still friends. We don't agree on everything, but, you know, God, it's my responsibility to love them even if we disagree. I went to Newton County Church. I asked Pastor, Pastor Shives. I said, Pastor Shives, do you have a Bible study going on? He said, nope. I said, can I get one started? Yep. Went in there, started teaching the Bible. We had two members who would show up every week. It went from two to 12, from 12 to 20, from 20 to 40. It started to grow rapidly. We started doing how to study the Bible. We started going point by point through how to study the Bible. And brothers and sisters, I remember one sister, she was loving it. She said, oh, Brother Lemon, I'm loving these studies. And I said, yeah. I said, you know, the spirit of prophecy says. And she said, whoa, ho, ho. Don't mention anything to me about the spirit of prophecy. Only tell me the Bible. I mean, she was anti-Ellen White. You think I went to that sister and said, look at here now. I believe in the prophet. You think, you think I was trying to shove it down her throat? I said, sis, what's the matter? She says, I don't want to hear it. I joined this church to believe in the Bible. I believe in the Bible. That's it. I said, no problem. I said, no problem at all. We started going through our how to study the Bible classes. She was there every week. She loved those classes so much. Brothers and sisters, do you know what happened? One day she came to me and she said, Brother Lemon, I am just loving these classes. They are so good. I said, amen, sis. She says, Brother Lemon, where did you get your understanding of all these things from? <laughs> I said, you really want to know, huh? She said, yeah. I said, come with me to my bag. Unzip my bag. I said, this little book right here, and I showed her testimonies of ministers and gospel workers under the chapter, How to Study the Bible. I showed her all these different things from all the different quotations, and I showed her, I said, sis, all I'm doing is I just pay attention to what Jesus told me. She said, you mean all those things you've been teaching and learning, you learned from those books? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, huh, okay. She walked away. She came back the following week. She looked for me when I arrived at church. She said, Brother Lemon, guess what? I said, what? She says, I surround my bed with the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, it's a gift. It, that's why it's called the gift of prophecy. Why would you hate a gift from God? You know, the only gifts that come from God are good and perfect ones. James 1.17 says that, doesn't it? Don't fight the prophet, brothers and sisters. Yes, she may make it so plain that we can't avoid it, and we'll have to come face to face with truth and accept it, but brothers and sisters, all God is trying to do is get you ready to meet him face to face. So get into the spirit of prophecy. These are your assignments. I'm serious. Get back into the spirit of prophecy. Stop bringing in all these strange books from Babylon. Babylon does not know how to get you and I into the most holy place by faith with Jesus. I'm serious. Babylon does not know how to do it. Because if they did, God wouldn't have to call people out of them. So I'm sorry. I, when it comes to prayer, we have a whole book on prayer. We don't need anybody from Babylon talking about 40 days, 50 days, or 20 days on prayer and all this other stuff. We can go right to inspiration. And God has given us everything we need. I don't know why we're inviting these people to our colleges and all this other stuff. God has already made it clear to us what we need. And then to invite someone who directly is promoting the ecumenical movement? That just testifies to how blind we have become. Get back into the word. Now let's get to the practical instructions. So while we're talking about the importance of the spiritual, we talked about getting back into the Bible, spirit of prophecy, all these things. I'm watching it. I'm watching it. Practical. Here we go. Practical. <laughs> Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the... Glory of God. So therefore, when we talk about practical, what was the first thing that God did with Israel when they came out of Egypt? He changed their diet. Brothers and sisters, you need to change your diet. Talking about the practical. Councils on Diets and Foods, page 347, says that God gave Israel the diet best adapted to prepare their minds for what they were about to receive on Mount Sinai. That's why he gave them the manna. 
Because God understands the connection between the food, the mind, and the fact that in Romans 7, 25, it says we serve the law of God with our minds. So if we're going to faithfully understand God's law, that means the mind needs to be in a good condition so we can follow the law of God properly. And the food and the drink that you and I put in our system has a direct effect on the brain nerves, which houses the mind. Watch this. What is the glory of God? Well, you remember in Exodus 33, 18, Moses says, show me thy glory. Amen? God responds by saying in verse 19, I will show you my goodness and proclaim the name of the Lord. So therefore, the glory of God, the name of God, and the goodness of God are the same thing. It's synonymous. It's like me saying, Brother Nate, please show me your car. He says, no problem. I will show you my Subaru. We're talking about the same thing. We're just using different language. I know you don't have a Subaru, but I didn't remember what the car was. But you get my point. So therefore, it, it, we're talking about the same thing, even though we use different items. You following? That's all that happened. Show me your glory. God says, I'll show you my goodness. The reason why this is important is because most people do not know how to eat and drink to the glory of God. They assume, but they don't biblically know. I'm showing you how you can biblically know. So first and foremost, we have to find out what is the glory of God. Once we find out what the glory of God is, we can know how to eat and drink to it. Does that make sense? All right. So therefore, show me your glory, goodness, and name. Now, God does it. Watch what God does now. God in Exodus 34, 5 through 7, shows his glory and proclaims his name. What did he do? The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. So God revealed his what? His character. Is that right? That's what he revealed. Show me your glory. God says, no problem. I'll proclaim my name. When God proclaimed his name, he revealed his character. And always remember, that's why God would say, and they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Names represent character. Now, understanding that, since the glory of God is God's character, how do we eat and drink to it? Very simple. Good question. Glad you asked. Notice. We can observe some attributes of God's character. Now write those verses down, and I'll explain them for time's sake. In Deuteronomy 30, 19 and 20, that simply says, I present before you life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life. So God told us to choose what? Choose life. Verse 20, God says, choose life because I am your life. So therefore, an attribute of God's character thus far is that he is life. Oh, excuse me. Then John 14, 6, that was your next verse. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. So therefore, God shows that he is Life, therefore, whatsoever you and I eat or drink, it should reproduce life in me, not death. You and I, as instruments in God's hands, are not allowed by the owner of our body to eat or drink anything that will deplete life from us. You're going down the aisle and you're thinking, man, I'm thirsty. You decide I want to go ahead and get some Sprite. So you take that Sprite off the shelf, you look at the Sprite, and you realize, wow, Sprite has on the back of it something called high fructose corn syrup. Real nice way of saying empty calorie sugar. That high fructose corn syrup is going to deplete or weaken my white blood cells. My white blood cells is what God naturally put inside of me to defend my body from sickness and disease. So therefore, I look at that and I say, this high fructose corn syrup is not drinking to the glory of God because it's weakening my system rather than strengthening it back on the shelf. Amen. You see how simple that is? We take some beef. We go ahead and take some beef. We tilt it to the side. We watch that cool little pool of blood just go there in the corner like that. And we look at that beef and we say, wow, look at that beef. Well, I tell you, I can't wait to cook this thing and eat it. And then all of a sudden, we take that beef and we, we think about it. We say, well, you know, it's funny. 
In Genesis 9, God said, don't eat blood. And that was before a Jewish man ever walked on this earth. Then in Acts 15, in the New Testament, when the Judaizers were coming to the new believing Christians and telling them what to do, they went to the conference of their day and they had to get a decision. And when you read Acts 15, verse 19 and 20, and verse 29 and 30, it tells us that the instructions were to the New Testament believing Christians that they were not to eat blood. Why should I not eat blood? Leviticus 17, 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. If there's disease in that cow, it's going to flow through its blood. So therefore, God says, I don't want my people eating blood. It was not a suggestion. It was a command. Ladies and gentlemen, I declare unto you, if you are eating beef, chicken, or fish with blood in it, in other words, if you are eating beef, chicken, or fish that is not kosher, or halal, you are just as much a sinner as the person who's eating pork, shrimp, and crab. Are you following? It is just as much a violation of the word of God to eat animals with blood and fat in it as it is to eat pork and shrimp and crab. So we take that beef and we take that chicken, we take that fish, we put it back on the shelf. But then we go ahead and we get to the broccoli section. And we get to the broccoli section and we look at that broccoli and it's nice and green and we say, well, you know, even when a broccoli is severed from the ground, it still maintains its nutrition, its vitamins and so on in it. You know what? And then when I eat it, the food gets broken down into blood. The blood carries the nutrition to my cells. My cells carry it throughout my body and help strengthen and nourish my body. You know what? To the glory of God in the cart. And you go down the list of your water and different things. You can literally take an instruction like 1 Corinthians 10, 31, and you can literally make it so practical that you can go grocery shopping based on that principle. You remember Psalms 46, 1 and 2? God is my refuge and strength. So whatever I eat, it should strengthen the body, not weaken it. So therefore, Dunkin' Donuts got to go. Huh? You see how simple this is? I, li I like to take a simple approach to what God teaches us about health reform. Health reform is all inside of the Bible. And what, now, here's what happens. Every time we eat the Dunkin' Donut or any time we eat the beef or the chicken or the fish with the blood in it and all these other things, you want to know one of the reasons why it's a sin when we do it after understanding what God says, after understanding what God says, let me say it one more time, after understanding what God says. The reason why is because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, what? Don't you know your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? And then it says, and you are not your own because you've been bought with a price precious blood of jesus what's my point my point is is that christ bought your body he didn't buy your spirit we don't believe that we have spirit beings inside of us he bought your body now when jesus bought your body you know i believe some of you like me and because i believe some of you like me Maybe if I ever came back to San Diego, you just might invite me in your house. Now, if you invited me in your house, chances are that if I came in your house and was looking around and said, man, you know, this is a beautiful home. And then I, let's say I saw a vase that I really liked. I said, boy, that's a nice vase. And then you all went in the kitchen to go clean up. And then I took that vase and I just slipped it in my coat. We finish having dinner and then I just go back home to Georgia. Here you are in your house and you're looking around and you're saying, you know, I, we had a vase that was right there, but it's gone. ever since Brother Lemon was here, it's gone now. <laughs> so then all of a sudden, you start thinking about it. You say, where could it be? So you're going through and going through, and you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't know where it could be. So eventually, you get up the nerve to call me. Brother Lemon, how are you? I say, hey, how you doing? He said, and you know, you, you muster up the courage, and you say, Brother Lemon, I got to ask you a question. Did you see a vase that was in my house? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I saw that vase. It was nice. 
Okay. Did you take it? <laughs> and here it is, I say, actually, I did. <laughs> now, I can almost guarantee, I don't know if you'll say it, but you'll probably at least be thinking it. You'll probably be saying, you know, I really like this man, but this brother just stole from my house. <laughs> is that right? Would you at least be thinking that if you don't verbally say it? So in other words, let's say you get up the, brother, let me get, you stole from me. I said, well, actually, what it was was there was a family that really loved vases, and I knew that this one's going to be very pretty, so I just took it because I wanted to give it to them and put a smile on their face. Now, chances are you're going to say, you know, that's nice and everything, but brother, you stole from my house. Right or wrong? So in other words, just because I had a good intention does not negate the fact that I violated the law. Is that right? You know, a lot of people today, when they eat whatever they want and dress their bodies however they want, they say, well, I did it with good intentions, but God says you're still a thief. If you did not ask me, if you did not consult my word, if you did not go to me first before you just indulged in whatever you wanted to, God says then heaven recognizes you as violating the eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. Our bodies don't belong to us. We cannot, brothers and sisters, just put what we want in it because the belly growled loud enough. No wonder Philippians 3, 18 and 19 says, whose God is their bellies. And so you'll find that what God says we should do, we should do it, trusting that the Spirit of God will give us the self-control. You know, that's also a fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the, the, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance self-control. Through the Spirit of God, you can say no to the things that are bad and yes to the things that are good. The Bible talks about times to eat. The Bible talks about the amounts of food to eat. The Bible even gives us the quality of food we should eat. All of this you can find in the Scriptures. All of it. Now, because of time's sake, I need to move fast. If you want any of these quotations or any of these things, get with me after, and I'll make sure to give it to you. Now, do you believe that the brain and the mind are the same thing? Most people say yes, but the answer is no. The brain nerves which communicate with the entire system are the only medium through which heaven can communicate to man and affect his inmost life. Now, the brain nerves is how heaven communicates with us. Now, watch this. The brain is equivalent to a hard drive. The mind is equivalent to software. Question. If you have messed up if your hard drive is messed up, no matter how perfect your software is, will it work? No. no. So therefore, what do you need to make sure you have? A good hard drive. The brain nerves is the hard drive. What you and I eat and drink directly affects the condition of the brain nerves that we just saw is the only medium that heaven communicates with us. So if you and I choose to say, I don't care what that man said, I don't care what the spirit of prophecy says, I'm going to lean on my skewed view of what the Bible says, and I'm going to pay attention to my belly God, and when it growls, I'm going to eat what I want. If we choose to do that, then what's going to happen is going to affect our software. And Councils on Diets and Foods, page 54, says, those who indulge in appetite cannot understand present truth. That's why perhaps you may have challenges in board meetings sometimes. I'll say it. The pastor didn't say anything to me about board meetings. He said nothing. But I've just been in the church for a while, and I've been in boards. And I know the challenges sometimes that we face. So what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is sometimes people can't understand the gospel clearly because they're doing things that's damaging their brain nerves that's directly affecting the condition of their mind. Watch this. Food equals blood. Blood equals the health of our brain. The brain is where we get our thoughts from. Our thoughts is where we ultimately have actions. Our actions repeated form habits. Our habits equals our character, and it's our character that determines our destiny. That's the connection between diet and eternity. That's the connection between diet and eternity. Most people today don't believe what I eat and drink affects my lifestyle. You can't read the Bible and say that. Eating and drinking habits can literally determine, to a very large degree, whether we will enter into eternity or not. And if you don't believe me, I want you to read Isaiah 59, 2, 
and then compare it with Ezekiel 16, 49. Isaiah 59, 2 says, iniquity separates us from God. Ezekiel 16, 49 says, overeating is iniquity. Is that simple enough? Isaiah 59, 2 says, iniquity separates us from God. Ezekiel 16, 49 says, one of the sins of Sodom was overeating, fullness of bread. And the Bible called it iniquity. So your eating and drinking habits, according to the Bible, can affect your salvation, period. And that's why health reform is so important. Well, let's bring this thing to a close. My, hey now, what's happening here, okay? Oh, I got to go past this. I wanted to give this to you, but I'm going to go past it. What's happening to you? Oh, good. <laughs> I know. All I was showing was that President Obama, when he came and he started to establish all the trade unions, and I was talking about practical things to do. Um, when he established the trade unions, we were told in inspiration that the time is fast coming when the controlling power of the labor unions will be very oppressive. It talks about how uh, those who refuse to join the labor unions will be marked men. It tells us that the trade unions will be one of the agencies that will bring upon this earth a time of trouble such as not been since the world began. These unions are one of the signs of the last days. So trade unions were really huge. I can't go into these details now. Um, the reason why I say that is because one of the things that God told us to do as a result of the trade unions is he said, take your families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions. Why did God tell us to do that? Because he said, for the, in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. Another practical preparation that God has called us to do is to get out of the city into the country. Have no fear as far as, well, Brother Lemon, how am I practically going to do that? You're going to do it the same way perhaps my brother did it. You know what my brother did? He prayed. He was broke. He had nothing, no money whatsoever. He prayed. And he said, Father, we have nothing, but we know what your counsel says, and we're not going to make excuses. We're just asking you to open the door and do that which is impossible for us to do, but possible for you to do. And you know what God did? God blessed them with a 29-acre property, three greenhouses, horses, and a wonderful log home, and it has alternative energy and power. They've been there for over two years free. Free. <laughs> you see, America is in a recession. Heaven's bank account is not. God has people all over the place that are doing it. You see, brothers and sisters, if the truth be told, I want you to understand that God got us out of the city. That's our little country retreat. The Lord allowed us to go from the brick and mortar of Hollis, Queens, New York, into a little log home in Monticello, Georgia. And when we moved there, the Lord blessed us. I mean, it was simple. It was different. But, you know, we started to learn how to heat. That's how we actually heat our house. We had to learn how to cut down wood so we can go ahead and cut it down. And I'll tell you something, fathers, it's a great way to spend time with your children. We went down on our property and started cutting down trees and all these things, and we literally started to do this to heat our house. I was a remote control guy. I was the kind of guy that liked to press a button and everything just works in a house. But one of the things God taught me when I moved to the country is that it's country living, not country location. It's a lifestyle. God says, I'm going to remove that remote control mindset out of you, boy. I'm going to get you to work. And I had to go ahead and start cutting and using the sweat of my brow, working with my boys and going ahead and cutting down trees and doing all these things to simply have something like heat in our home. But I'll tell you what, it's real nice when money all of a sudden starts to look funny. When all of a sudden when income is not the same way it used to be, you can say, praise God that I got enough to still keep my home warm for my wife and for my children. Not only that, after that, we had to learn how to garden. You know, in Third Selected Messages, it talks about how an angel showed Ellen White how to plant fruit trees. We did that method. This is after three months of being put in the ground. Look at the size of the twigs, brothers and sisters. But look at the size of those big old fruits hanging off of them. I got a little thing called a refractometer, and that way you can test the sugar content to know the nutrition in your food. I took one of those peaches off and dropped a drop of it on the refractometer and looked at it. It came back a 16. 19 is like Garden of Eden. It came back a 16. That was after one year. I went to the local grocery store and bought a peach from them, and guess what it came back as? Eight. We had double the nutrition, and we could actually go grocery shopping in the backyard. 
we started learning all these different methods. This is my oldest one, the pianist. That's my little baby girl, Jada. And we would go ahead and start doing raised beds, and we started learning all these nice little tricks on how to till the soil and work with the soil. And we started to do these things, and I was amazed at the character development it did for the children. Brothers and sisters, even if the Bible and spirit of prophecy was dead wrong on country living, you couldn't pay me to move back into the city based on what I saw it do for my children. We need to give our children something better. These wicked cities have nothing, nothing to offer our children. You know, Ellen White says that being in the city cannot make a child 1% better in anything. And when I talk about getting out of the cities, I'm not talking about abandoning the cities. God said, work the cities, just don't live in them. I'm often in the cities. What am I doing? I'm ministering to the people out there. But do you know what's sweet? Ellen White says that when Enoch went into the city, he would minister to the people and bring them back home to his country home to let them see what Christianity was really all about. I remember we ministered, we did the gospel of health with a Muslim family, and we taught that Muslim family the wonderful truths of the health message. And do you know, brothers and sisters, that, that the wife accepted the third angel's message? The husband didn't stop her either. And then we said, let's invite him to the house. We invited them to our home. We invited them to our home. Uh, Jared and the girls um, and Caleb, they started to teach their children scripture songs. This was Muslim kids. And the father said, it's fine. They started teaching them scripture songs. My wife took Sister Ray and brought her into the kitchen area, started showing how to make this healthy food. Took the husband, me and him, we walked down our trail. I took him, we started to take a walk down the trail, brothers and sisters. I took him to this area called the sanctuary. And we took him to our sanctuary area of our property, and I just started to talk to him about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I said, nature, do your work. Because we are told that nature is God's second book. So while I'm talking to him about the statements in the written book, I'm trusting that nature is going to reveal to him the God of heaven as well. And, today, and together, nature and I was working with that man, and I put my arm around him. I just started telling him about the wonderful truths of the gospel. And he said, you know, Dwayne, he says, I'm not really opposed to the gospel. He says, I'm really not opposed to it. He says, I like what you all believe. And he says, by the way, it coincides a lot with different Islamic beliefs. And I said, I know. And we began to talk and dialogue. What I'm saying is that when God gave us country living, it was designed to teach us faith. It was designed to help us grow in grace. It was designed to sharpen us and to bring into an experience between us and Jesus that would better prepare us for his second coming and the final crisis. But you got to do what he says. You got to do what he says. That's my bride. These are the two that are not with us, Kayla and Jada. And of course, you all met Jared and Caleb. The Lord allowed us all to work together to become a family in ministry. And you know what was so sweet? In the book Education, page 250, it says, when God made the family, he made the family not just to worship together, but to work together as well. And I thank God to live in that ideal. And by his grace, you can too, because God is no respecter of persons. Amen? Amen. Evangelism. Let's simply close on this point right here. What are we going to do specifically with our young people? So on the spiritual side, set time for prayer. Develop that study. Get into the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Understand the sanctuary message. Get back into the spirit of prophecy. The practical, go ahead and start making those reforms and changes in the diet. Start looking at the areas where you and I know where we're being rebellious and go to God and say, Lord, give me more of your spirit that I can have temperance to do that which you have told me to do. In addition to that, get out of the city. Start preparing. Start pleading. Start planning. Go before God and say, Father, even if it seems impossible, I'm grateful that Matthew 19, 26 says that which is impossible with man is possible with God. Practical. Now, evangelism. Get to work. Get to work. What's the work that we are to do? I'm going to show you right here. To my ministering brethren, I would say, prosecute this work with tact and ability. Set to work the who? Young men and the young women where? In our churches. What are we going to do with the young men and young women in our churches? Combine the medical missionary work with the proclamation of the third angel's message. Either a little old lady from the 1800s with a third grade education is telling us that, or Jesus is telling us that. Was Jesus the master evangelist? Yes. So if Jesus is telling us what to do in evangelism, I think we would do wise to do what he says, period. Amen? All right. It says... 
make regular organized effort to lift the churches out of the dead level into which they have fallen and have remained for years. Send into the churches workers who will set the principles of health reform in their connection with the third angel's message before every family and individual. Encourage all to take a part in work for their fellow men and see if the breath of life will not quickly return to the churches. You know, when a church is dead and it begins to breathe again, you know what that's called? Revival. Our young people, God has just showed us, are the integral weapon or ingredient to revival and reformation in God's church. That's why we can't leave our young people out of this. We have to get them involved. But are we going to get them involved with empty socials? No. Are we going to get them involved with mixing the world with truth? No. What we're going to do is we're going to do what God said. Now, don't get me wrong. Young people still need recreation. Just remember, it's recreation, not wreck the creation. God says the activities that we get our young people involved in, it should recreate his image in them. But God also says when it comes to the work, teach them the proclamation of the third angel's message. Combine it with the medical missionary work and see how it will finish the work. If we do what God says, brothers and sisters, we get the blessing. Because as I said in the prayer, the blessing is in the doing, not in just the hearing. And God will show us what to do. Now, I'm going to specifically ask for six minutes. Why am I asking for six minutes? Because there's something very important that I need to share with you. As I have traveled throughout this world, I have seen that the greatest thing God's people need is training. They need training. But the problem is, is that there's not enough facilities, first of all, to train everybody. Number two, sometimes it may be cost prohibitive or time prohibitive. So my wife and I were privileged to travel to Australia last year, along with our children. We all went, and we went to train missionaries. And God is so good that he allowed us to train the missionaries in three things that God told us to do. Gospel ministry, medical missionary work, and the publishing work or the canvassing work. That training has been recorded. And now it's available for God's people if they want the training but cannot get to it by the other means, this is a way now to bring the training to your homes. I'm going to show you this six-minute clip, and after this, we will be done. I want you to pay attention to what is revealed as it relates to this training. That's the location where we were. That is my bride and that's my son walking with us on the property. A 600 acre property owned by one Seventh day Adventist family. Notice that quotation, especially the statement in bold at the bottom. question. The natural disasters, the economic crisis, what is it all leading to? It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of what? The Sunday Sabbath. That this sin has brought what? Calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. That work that we're called to do Understanding time is we must reflect the lovely image of Jesus.
Preset, compare command with command. Line, make sure that it is balanced and accurate. Beware of fanaticism. Typology showed us that. If we knew how to study in types, we should have seen this. And what happens is too many of God's people are falling into all these realms of fanaticism and we're becoming unbalanced and inaccurate because we did not understand typology. Very, very imperative. Context. The pillars of our faith as expressed by the prophet, the three angels' messages, sanctuary message, the state of the dead, the spirit of prophecy, the Sabbath. These are things that make up our pillars. Out of these, you find several branches. This is what is the night and day difference between a seven-day Adventist by name and a seven-day Adventist by lifestyle. If we want to be agencies in God's hand to go ahead and do our hydrotherapy treatments, do our poultices, and do all of these massages, and the list goes on, of all of these different things, and we want these remedies, these, these remedial agents, to work on behalf of the diseased, sin-sick soul, God says you must have the Holy Spirit, not just in your heart, but in your home. God is the one that made us, and therefore we need to go to God's book to know how to best take care of the machinery. He that is faithful in that which is least will be faithful also in much. Brothers and sisters, when we begin to consider what I'm putting inside of my body, what I'm doing to my body, if we can look at it on a very small or least level to say whatever I put in my system, it must, make, it must help myself be strong. Because if it helps my cells to be strong, then it helps my tissues to be strong. Helps the tissues, helps the organs. Helps the organs, helps the system, helps the systems, helps the body. You start with the cells, then it graduates to the tissues, then it graduates to the organs, then it graduates to the systems, and then it ultimately is the body. So that's your order. And that basically is literally your hot and cold facial. Three minutes in the hot, and then 30 seconds in the cold. Do you see the blood all there in her face? You see how it just draw? I mean, it's incredible to watch this happen. Isn't it great? <coughs> Get lots of pictures. <laughs> blackstrap molasses is so powerful that they actually use blackstrap molasses for several things. Um, you can actually take it as a pre-surgery and post-surgery remedy. A lot of people who use blackstrap molasses, it promotes speedy healing of wounds amid other healing processes. That's the goal of, of doing these cooking demonstrations, is to, to show Jesus at the end of the day. <laughs> All right, and you add enough water to make it nice and creamy. Here we go. Nice yep. cheese, and it smells delicious. And that's how it gives it that nice, you know, consistency of like a slice of cheese. Have a canvas. And the reason why you want a canvas is so that it gives you something to say. Yes? Hi, my name is Jared, and we're students working on a scholarship project promoting health and happiness in the community, and I just wanted you to take a look. And that is it. That is to give you all an idea of some of the things that are covered within the training. It has become our great burden to share this with God's people so that it can be a means and a tool of empowering God's people so that the work can be finished. We are in the process of seeking property in Atlanta, Georgia, where we will eventually get a training school started. We believe, by the grace of God, it would happen sometime in 2013. 
So we're praying that that, in fact, would be the case. So until then, we solicit your prayers. It's been a privilege to serve you all. And I thank God for the opportunity to have been here this weekend. Pastor Williams, I tell you, I had a great time. It was a privilege to get to know you, sir. And I look forward to getting to know you better. And I want to thank the staff here for all of those who played a part in making this meeting a reality. My hope and my prayer is that we will receive the wake-up call, receive the instruction, and take on the assignments that God has given to us. And I believe if we do it faithfully, we will experience true revival that will lead to true reformation that will help us ultimately fulfill the great gospel commission to go ye therefore. And so with that being said, I'd like to invite all of us to stand as we officially close out our meetings. We want to thank God for the opportunity to have done this. It has been a blessing. Pastor, I don't know if you had any final comments. Um, so the microphone is here if you wanted this one. Okay. Okay, thank you. Some of you may have come here tonight to, uh, for the Walter Vyth 7 o'clock meeting. If you are here, uh, just stay by. We are going to have that, uh, have that session for you available in a little, just a little bit. For the rest of you, thank you very much for coming. Amen. Brother uh, Lemon, thank you so much. We've been, it's been a real blessing. Amen? Amen? Amen. Would you go ahead and have our concluding prayer? Yes, let us pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful, Lord, for the time that we have spent. We thank you for another Sabbath that has now gone into eternity. We pray, dear God, that you will continue to remind us that though the sun has set, may the sun of righteousness, Jesus Christ, continue to shine bright and beautiful within our hearts. And Lord, I pray that as we head our separate ways and begin a new and untried week, may thy grace be with us as we go. And we thank you, Lord, again for this sweet fellowship. Keep us faithful until the next time we are privileged to meet. For we ask it all Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, in about 10 minutes or less, we will begin that next meeting.